Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, it's Dr. Hermes from Oregon State University. Um, he is, I, I, I have listened to a lot of nutrition talks. I'm not an expert in nutrition. I wish I was because I, I feel like I get a lot of questions related to nutrition. And uh, Dr. Hermes, um, out of the, you know, umpteen years I've done this now, uh, Dr. Hermes' talk on nutrition is, is literally my favorite. It's really good. Um, he can talk for a couple hours on nutrition. So um, it, it's a really, you know, I know everyone's going to have questions. The most important thing from my perspective is that you now know each other and you know how to reach out to people. So ask questions, but also take advantage of, of him um, giving this talk because it's, it's really useful, especially for um, beginning farmers, pastured farmers, alternative um, kind of producers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, um, I'll, I'm going to turn over the screen to Dr. Hermes. Okay, thank you, Maurice. Uh, uh, thank you all for uh, attending. Uh, this is uh, uh, the third uh, webinar that I've done. Usually I talk in front of people and I would prefer that because it's, it's easier as a speaker, I've been doing this a long time, to see the faces of people who are listening. You can kind of see if you're, you're getting things. So please uh, do ask questions if you, if you need to uh, and happy to answer, answer questions. Just a little bit of my background. I am the extension poultry specialist here in the state of Oregon, have been since the early 1990s. Uh, before that, I was a county agent here in, in Oregon since the late 80s. And before that, I was actually there at UC Davis where I did most of my work in the avian science department. Uh, and I graduated there in 87 with a, my PhD in uh, uh, in the avian developmental genetics under the direction of Dr. Ursula Abbott, uh, who was there for many years at Davis. So while it's been a long time since I've been at Davis, I did start my poultry career uh, there at, uh, at UC Davis. So it's kind of, uh, I wish I could have come down. I had planned on that, but with the uh, weather the way it is and uh, it's been raining pretty good here, don't know what's going on in the mountains. Uh, but uh, teach classes and other things, so it's just hard to get away. Anyway, so let's uh, let's begin our discussion of uh, this this question of nutrition. Uh, and what we're going to do is first, just to begin things. First, I'm just going to lead you through a, a, a bit of the difference between nutrition and then also feeding. Um, much of my work, uh, my degree is not in nutrition. I've done this basically, this is, was, has been a need here in the state of Oregon for, uh, for many years for small producers like many of you. Uh, and uh, so we have really embarked on, well, that's not really my, my degree area. It's uh, something that is of interest and we've been doing it now uh, since, uh, really since the mid 1990s, I've been working in, uh, in feeding of, of poultry, particularly small flock birds. Uh, also, just realize that uh, feeding is extremely important in any production scheme. It is the highest of your continuing costs. So if you are, uh, when you build a facility, there might be some uh, significant cost, but uh, year after year, your feed costs are going to be uh, significant. Uh, and so we need to address that. Uh, also, uh, feeding is uh, only should be considered a part of an overall production program. Uh, you can feed the birds the best feed you have. If you don't manage them well, then they're not going to perform, and vice versa. You can uh, manage them as uh, is the uh, best manager in the in the region. Uh, but if you don't feed them well, you feed them a poor diet, they're not going to perform. And so that's a really a part of the overall program. And then realize that in feeding, as in anything, there are no magic bullets. There's nothing that you can feed a chicken. Uh, that is going to make it uh, uh, perform best. It's a formulated diet, and we're going to go through that as we, uh, as we progress uh, through the evening. So let's take a look at nutrition versus feeding. And nutrition is really all about biochemistry. Uh, what's going on inside that uh, chicken when she consumes some kind of feedstuff is there's a whole gamut of biochemical reactions that are going to occur uh, to keep her alive. You are just simply stoking that fire by feeding them. And so when we, uh, uh, this is very uh, important part of it, but we're going to assume uh, that uh, we don't need to understand all the biochemistry. 
we're simply going to look at this in terms of an applied in a practical way. Uh, it's important that we understand a little bit of what's going on, but we don't need to dwell on that. So feeding is really about making sure the ingredients that we're feeding our birds are going to be utilized and useful in those biochemis uh, biochemical reactions that are going to go on. So we need to formulate rations or diets, feeds, uh, to meet the biochemical needs of, of the animal we're feeding, and in this case, that would be chickens. And whether or not the chickens are outdoors or indoors in commercial uh, application or they're out on pasture, their requirements are more or less the same. There's not a lot of variability in the, well, those kinds of things for maximum productivity. Also, as I said, uh, your major cost is going to be, or continuing cost, is going to be the cost of feed. And the estimate is something in excess of 70% of your total cost is going to be in the form of feed. Now, if you were to take organic feeds or special ingredients that increase the cost, then this number even goes higher. So realize that uh, this is a significant cost. So feeding, we want to make sure that we're feeding the best feed that we can. We don't want to be skimping on feed. Uh, it's not a good idea to skimp uh, because they simply are not going to perform well. They need a good diet. And then the, the overall uh, part of feeding in an overall production system, it's part of it. However, uh, as you can see by the diagram, those birds in the center uh, while we can feed them well, if they don't have the proper genetics, they haven't been selected for a particular purpose. In other words, if, if you want to produce eggs, then, then purchasing stock that are either fancy birds, Polish or some other fancy breed, or they've been selected for meat production, their egg production really isn't going to be very well. And then vice versa, if you want to produce meat animals for your operation, then you would not necessarily want to choose uh, birds that have been selected for egg production or any of the other uh, fancy birds. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and then over uh, under all of that would be management. So if we are not managing them well, we don't have proper facilities, we, don't, uh, we, aren't, we aren't managing their lighting or their uh, uh, temperature management or number of things, then, uh, then they're not going to perform. So all of these things are going to impact some more than others, but certainly they all impact the productivity of the animals that you are, are trying to paint. And then, as I said, there are no magic bullets. Uh, and when I say that, there, I mean there's nothing there that is, is, is something that you can uh, that is going to automatically cause uh, birds to perform better. There's a lot of discussion of some of these things I've listed here. Fermented feeds. They have a role. Uh, they may not be the, uh, the magic bullet you're looking for. They're not going to decrease your feed costs dramatically. They might de decrease them a little bit because the birds are going to be uh, better able to digest the feed because it's been soaked for a period of time. It's easier for them to digest. Diatomaceous earth is used oftentimes primarily to reduce parasites, but certainly that's another uh, uh, issue to, to uh, incorporate a little bit of diatomaceous earth in their feed. Apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is known to change the pH in the water. It reduces the pH slightly, not a great deal. If you try to do it too much, then they won't drink the water. They don't like the acidic nature of, the, of apple cider vinegar. Uh, but it reduces the pH, and so there is some benefit in helping to prevent some specific disease organisms that might be a bird, but it's not going to fix a sick bird. Uh, it may be, uh, be helpful in a, in a process. And then or, uh, oregano oil or any of the uh, uh, essence oils are, are, may have their place, but they're not going to, you shouldn't consider them a magic bullet. They're not going to fix a broken problem. Uh, it's something that uh, you need to be using in a, for a particular purpose, may or may not be valuable. Now, when we are, uh, are feeding uh, chickens of any kind, we need to consider what are some of our objectives 
uh, when we do this. And depending on what we're growing, the, objection, the objectives may be different. But certainly, overall, we want healthy, productive flocks. We want animals that are, uh, are not uh, being debilitated by disease. We want them to be producing at high levels, either laying lots of eggs or growing rapidly or something of that nature for production purpose. Uh, and we want this on all of our birds, not just a few of the best individuals. And so our objective really in poultry feeding is to produce these a healthy productive flocks. If we consider egg production, now this is in terms of commercial. Now this isn't, when I say commercial, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of birds. If you are selling your production, by definition, you're a commercial producer. And so a commercial producer wants these uh, highly productive flocks. You want them healthy, but you want them to be laying lots of eggs. Uh, remember, this is a, a, a reproductive process. Anything reproductive in animals will be impacted greatly by stresses, uh, which could be from the outside, could be temperature issues, could be uh, feed issues, could be a number of things. But reproductive issues uh, are not required for the bird to survive. And so under, under any conditions of stress, then those uh, uh, production will oftentimes decline. And that's sometimes the first thing we notice in egg flocks when there's a problem is production begins to decline. So we want uh, these productive flocks, we want maximum egg production. Uh, that's the whole point. And so we want to maximize their productivity. We want to maximize that productivity by, while also reducing the feed to the level that will maintain production, maximum production, but at the least amount of feed. We call that feed conversion or feeding efficiency. So we're efficiently feeding those animals. And then not only do we want lots of eggs, but we want high quality eggs. And so to do that, we need to feed them properly because that biochemistry that we talked about before, they're taking these feedstuffs, they're converting them, they're creating their own proteins, and they're putting those in eggs in the form of albumin and a portion of the yolk, as well as fat, that it, to make the yolk, and so that's going to improve the quality and then the quality of an eggshell. And so there are lots of things we want to do with uh, commercial egg birds. If we consider a, an egg bird, she is working metabolically very hard, that, uh, that metabol the metabolism, that biochemistry we're talking about. So let's take an example of an average hen laying 250 eggs a year, which is an outside of the realm of, of, of production. In fact, that's relatively low on a commercial operation, might be high on some of the more fancy breeds, but that would be an average backyard laying chicken. Uh, the average weight of those eggs is somewhere around two ounces, maybe a slightly uh, larger than that, but they're around two ounces, 56 to 65 grams, somewhere in that region. So if we do a little bit of math at, uh, at 250, two, two ounce eggs, that's 500 ounces of eggs in a year. We divide that by 16, that's 31 and a quarter pounds of eggs in a year. If an average hen weighs four pounds, that would be a production hen, uh, generally a leghorn or some of the red breeds that are somewhat smaller, uh, for, specifically for egg production. That means that uh, uh, she's producing almost eight times her body weight. That's a great deal of metabolic work. And so we need to realize that the chickens are not little robots. They're not machines. You don't put feed in one egg and, uh, in, in one end and expect eggs to come out the other end. It's a biological entity that will perform to the best she can based on conditions and feed. I always uh, 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 chuckle at some of these uh, Facebook uh, sites where they're backyard chickens or whatever, and somebody hangs a sign around their hen and says, I'm a freeloader. I haven't laid in two months. Well, there are reasons she's not laying. It could be feed. It could be some other uh, environmental condition. It could be her age. There are lots of things that are going to do that. Uh, she's not doing that uh, because she doesn't want to lay eggs. She's doing that because there's a reason. And that's what you're, as a manager, you have to realize is that there are reasons that they don't produce well. If we switch our thoughts to meat flock, 
body. So these would be birds uh, designed to be to, for slaughter uh, for a meat product. Once again, we want healthy, highly productive flocks. And production in meat birds really has to do with their growth rate. So we put their average daily gain, which in good birds is going to be in the, in the 0 0.13, 0 0.14 range of growth um, on a per daily basis. And their final body weight, we want, generally we want larger birds because of course we're selling on weight by the pound and therefore that means we have a higher weight than we can sell. So we're going to be more economically efficient if we reduce their feed cost, get them to grow fast, uh, and this is essentially what industry has done over the last, the large industry has done over the last five, six, seven decades of commercial uh, roller production. This is how they've gotten to where they are. If we look at a typical broiler chicken, so this is a Cornish cross type chicken, you can see the weight gains from the 1940s until oh, close to today, uh, gone for, uh, more than double their size in essentially that uh, 70 year period or so, uh, they've essentially doubled their, their size. Uh, and at the same time, while they're doubling their size, they've cut the growth rate in half, so, uh, growth period in half. So they've gone from 12 weeks to get a three pound bird to just over six weeks to get a nearly seven pound bird. And so, uh, so that's part of the, uh, what we talk about, healthy, productive flocks. Uh, that would be, uh, would help to improve our economic picture. Uh, and we look at the feed conversion, the amount of feed it takes to get those birds to that weight. A day, four pounds of feed for every pound of gain. We look at today, we're closer to 1.6 or so pounds of feed per pound. Now, interestingly, these birds, the Cornish cross, began their life as, a, as a, birds that were produced by essentially people like yourselves, small flock producers. These were not produced by industry. Uh, they were crosses. There was a contest back in the 1940s, uh, the Chicken of Tomorrow contest, because the birds that were available at that time were uh, were spent layers and cockerels from egg-laying groups. They're not particularly valuable as a meat product. And so this contest by the A&P the grocery store uh, said, let's, uh, let's try to get them to improve this. They developed this contest. And uh, a couple of producers, one in California, Charles Van Tress, uh, was won the contest uh, and uh, in, in all of the economic parts of the contest. Uh, and two year, two times in a row, it was every three year contest. They only ran it uh, twice and both years, Charles Van Trass won the contest. And so over the next 10 years, between him as the second place winner, Harry Saglio back on the East Coast, they kind of combined, they developed this thing we now call the Cornish Cross. And from there, uh, and that was the, really the birth of the industry, at the same time, they developed a bird, they developed an industry, and that's where we see these advances in growth rate and conversion and, and uh, weight gain kinds of things. And so this was uh, through uh, the same kinds of things that you're going through, feeding. Uh, we want to make sure we're maximizing our productivity, and that's really how it's done. Now, other objectives, if you're having just recreational flocks, uh, and these would be the fancy breed birds. Now, and they do they lay eggs? Yes. Uh, can they be used for meat? Yes. Are they efficient at either? No. And that's what we have to uh, consider: is these are being produced for their own. So we're selecting them and we're growing them mainly for healthy birds. We want to feed them a good balanced diet. So feather uh, condition, good body condition, uh, but we're selecting them for some standard appearance depending upon breed. Uh, and so we're not worried about them growing fast. We're not worried about them necessarily laying lots of eggs. We want enough eggs to reproduce them, uh, but we don't need uh, uh, eggs like we would on a production line. And besides uh, from bantams, the eggs are quite small and not particularly valuable as an eating product for sale 
unless you have markets that want specific breeds of hens to produce eggs. And then we can get into the whole realm of, of other species. There's lots of game birds and waterfowl that can also be produced for economic purposes uh, that you can add into a, a crop. Uh, they are used for different kinds of things. Uh, the pheasants and the, 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 the ringneck pheasant in the top middle is a chucker partridge are used for both uh, recreation as well as just for, uh, for meat processing. Down on the bottom right is the Bob White quail, and that's a wild species in the eastern part of the U.S. Uh, the one on the bottom left, that's a Coturnix quail. That's an old world uh, quail uh, that is a fast grower, fast maturing uh, bird, lays as well as our chickens, uh, probably better metabolism. Uh, they, they only weigh maybe 150 grams and then laying a 10 gram egg every day. Uh, and so they are highly productive birds. And then the two waterfowl, geese and ducks can also be raised. They are a part of the poultry uh, group uh, as far as definition is concerned. They are, they are poultry where the other game birds are not technically poultry. They're what's called an amenable species. So our objective for uh, these kinds of birds, whether they are uh, fancy birds or, or protein birds, Meat birds, they are young, rapidly growing birds, and so we need to feed them as such. Uh, young, uh, they, these could be roasters or turkeys, a little bit longer growing period. Uh, they tend to, uh, turkeys, depending on what you want, could be anywhere from 12 to 20 weeks. Uh, roaster chickens, typically around uh, nine or 10 weeks, and then the typical fryer is usually six to eight weeks, depending upon uh, breed and management system, how fast they grow, there's a lot of variable. Egg production birds, uh, they're being grown from young birds through adulthood up until they reach sexual maturity and beyond. And so what we're trying to do here with our feeding is to uh, uh, give them a sustained growth. We don't need maximum growth on, on laying birds. We want them to get to wait at, a, at the time that they are ready to lay eggs at 16 or 18 weeks of age. So we want them to maximize their weight there. We don't need them big when they're small because it's not uh, heavy when they're, when they're young. We don't need them that way. We want them at the proper weight at a certain period of time. And so we're, gonna, we're going to uh, feed them towards that. And then as they are adults, we're going to feed them from maximum egg production, which is, uh, so we're going to feed them in ways that they can maximize their egg production, have high quality eggs, uh, both internal contents and shape. If we're looking at these uh, recreation birds, we're going to grow them to follow a standard, some kind of a standard uh, that the standard of perfection, the American Poultry Association tells you what the standard is supposed to look like. We want them to have proper feather development because that's really what we're looking at on the outside of the bird is their feathers. We need, we'd like to have good egg production, but it doesn't have to be maximum, just good, good production. And then we want them healthy into advanced age. Uh, so some of these birds are going to be around laying eggs two, three, even four years. Generally, once they get to that age, three, four years of age, they begin to start to drop off on their egg production. Uh, because consider the amount of eggs that they produce, that's a lot of, she's doing a lot of work. And so uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's a, a drain on them as they continue to lay eggs. And then again, on the game birds and waterfowl, proper growth rate and egg production, that's what we're growing them for. And that's really based on their species. And then there's a lot of variability in management and feeding with the game birds compared to chickens. With game birds, we're dealing with multiple species. With they're all the same. They're, they're all chickens. Uh, so they all have uh, different breed types, but their feeding is more or less the same. And that's not necessarily true in the game birds. Now, as we start to think about feeding poultry uh, in general, we need to consider, consider their, uh, uh, their biology. They are a simple stomached animal, which means they're a monogastric which means they're similar, not identical, certainly, but they're similar to our own uh, digestive system. They are certainly closer to a human in their digestion than they are a sheep or cow, which are ruminants. 
And so they have a different requirement than do the monogastric. So we need to feed them in such a way that we can maximize their uh, available nutrients. When we consider their biology, then we look at the nutritional requirements. We have to make some decisions. There are ingredients versus nutrients. We feed nutrients by giving them ingredients. Ingredients are things like corn or oats or soybean or peas or whatever. Those are ingredients. Each one of those ingredients has a whole variety of nutrients in them. Their requirements are nutrients. And so we need to understand what the nutrient requirements are and then put together a mixture of ingredients to fulfill those nutrients. And while we're doing this, we need to have them have a balanced diet. That's the same thing that we need. In, in humans, we call it our recommended daily allowance. And so if you look on your food labels, it usually has something about fat and carbohydrates and sugars, uh, maybe sodium. And on that label, it will say this uh, has uh, 165 calories, where your, which is 10%, uh, let's say, of your daily requirement. And then it will have these, and that's, that's what they're doing, is they're talking about balancing the diet. Monogastric animals need the same thing. Ruminant animals, cattle, sheep, goats, anything that grazes, they don't need the same kind of balance that, uh, that monogastrics need because of the nature of their digestion. They're digesting grass and they're, they're utilizing microbes in their gut that's that grass. Once that grass is digested, not only do they get the value out of the grass, but they get the, the microbes as well. And so it's a little less precise in ruminants than it is in monogastric. A typical monogastric requires a relatively high protein and a relatively low fiber. Uh, fiber meaning cellulose, and we want that something less than five or six percent in the diet. And protein generally for production birds were something above 16 percent protein, depending upon species and, and production in chickens. Generally, the highest protein we're going to feed chickens is around 23 percent, uh, and uh, that would be for young, uh, young growing boilers. Uh, we're going to drop that as they get older. In laying birds, uh, we're going to generally start them at a lower protein diet and then uh, end them up at around 50 or 60 percent. And then not only is that protein need to be uh, relatively high, but that needs to have the proper ratio of amino acids. Protein is a long chain co uh, compound full of amino acids. There are about 20 amino acids that have uh, have a uh, that are necessary, uh, some of which are what we call essential, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, essential mean they have to be in the diet. Uh, and so we need to have certain amino acids. Chickens really do not have a protein requirement. You do not have to feed them 15% protein, 16% protein. What that is, is that's the combination of the amino acids and if you have all the amino acids at exactly the ratio, at the ratio they require, you can probably get away with a 12% diet. But when you feed ingredients, many of those ingredients don't have all the amino acids at the proper level. So typically we end up giving them a high total protein to make sure we hit all the thresholds of the amino acids. And then typically in poultry, we use a phase feeding process. Phase feeding meaning the phase of their life. And so when you go to the feed store and purchase sack feed, you get a starter diet, or you get, uh, harder to get nowadays, but uh, a grower diet, or grower developer, or we get a layer ration for laying birds. We get a turkey starter specifically for turkeys that are young birds. So this is phase. And so we start them, we feed them for a few weeks on a start diet, and then we change them to some kind of grower or developer, uh, and then we change them to some kind of a lane. That's phase feeding. We use that routinely in, uh, in poultry. 
to understand a little more, here is the digestive system of a chicken. Uh, it's very simple on a relative scale with others. Uh, they have a beak, uh, of course, and they don't have any teeth. There's no extant birds, existing birds that have teeth. Like some extinct birds that have had teeth. Uh, they were mostly uh, seabirds, uh, like penguins, uh, but uh, they no longer exist. Uh, and so they eat with a, with a beak. Uh, they tend to swallow everything whole, or they try to tear it. If they can, they'll tear it into smaller pieces and swallow it, but they're going to swallow it whole. They have no way of chewing anything with, their, with teeth. They don't have teeth. That will come later in the system. Connecting the, uh, to the crop is the esophagus, which is just the tube that, drop, that goes from the mouth down to the crop. Now, the crop is a storage organ. It has the function similarly to the stomach of a mammal in the fact that you can store things there for a period of time. Very little digestion goes on. It's mainly just storage. And so when you watch birds consume, they will sit and they will gorge for a period of time. When they stand up and walk away, especially chickens, broilers in particular, uh, you will see at the, at the top of their breast, the base of their neck in the front, there will be this big lump. That's the, the crop full of feed. And then they will generally go and sit down. And then over the course of time, a few hours, that feed will, will evacuate out of the crop, go down into the proventriculus, which is considered the glandular stomach. This is where hydrochloric acid is released to begin the breakdown. It softens up the feed. It gets into the gizzard. Now the gizzard takes the place of the teeth. It grinds the feed. Uh, so it's gonna be grinding uh, the high, harder parts. If you are ranging your birds, they're eating whole grains or they're eating insects, a lot of hard bodied insects like beetles or, or mealworm, things of that nature. It's a good idea to make sure they have some kind of grit uh, because the grit will reside in the gizzard They'll eat it, they'll, they'll swallow it, it'll stay in the gizzard, and then acts as kind of like a mortar and pestle. It stones inside of the gizzard and it grinds the, the grain or the, the, the carapace of the, of the insects so that they can be ground up. Uh, once it's got a small enough particle size, uh, it goes into that first loop of the small intestine, that's the duodenal loop, and there it's uh, infused with enzymes from the pancreas and bile from the liver, uh, and that helps the digestion process. So all the digestion here is chemical uh, from here on. And so as it moves through the small intestine, those enzymes are acting on all of those ingredients, separating out the nutrients. The nutrients, when they get to their smallest size, they get go through the membrane, through the digestive system into the bloodstream. And are distributed. By the time we get down to the uh, the, the small intestine ends where the uh, uh, large intestine begins. At the bottom end, you can see there are kind of two little wings sticking out and the, uh, the cloaca becomes kind of bulbous. That's the end of the small intestine, beginning of the large intestine. Uh, the large intestine is quite uh, short in a bird, uh, particularly chickens, uh, maybe two or three inches tops. Its main function is to check, draw back water. And so it's going to absorb, resorb a lot of the water. So when the, uh, uh, when the waste is eliminated, then it tends to be relatively dry in most cases. Now, the two paired cica that are there, that look like wings, uh, in a chicken, an adult chicken, they're about the size of a pencil. Uh, and they are there for uh, fermentation, also some immune response. Uh, they are useful, but they're not necessary for a bird. Uh, chicken. They can be removed and the bird will survive just fine. Kind of think about them in terms of an appendix in a human. Uh, that's kind of the same, same thing. They have a useful uh, a purpose. A uh, lot in the old days we thought the like, appendix in a human was, had, didn't have any value. It was vestigial and it's really not. It has an immune function and other things. Um, but you can live just fine without it and chickens can do that with this. Every once in a while, you'll notice uh, your chicken will defecate a, a dark uh, mass with their droppings. It has a lot of odor to it. Those are cecal uh, droppings. That's eliminating from the cica. Uh, and, and because it's fermented, it has, tends to have more odor uh, with it. So that's basically a, the, uh, 
uh, a very uh, uh, simple digestive system uh, for a, a chicken. The whole process from the time she eats to the time that the waste is eliminated is around six to eight hours. So it goes very rapidly. In a mammal, it's closer to 24 hours, uh, but in birds, it's very quick uh, in the process. So when we consider our balanced diet, what that essentially means is all of the nutrients will be found at the proper level. I have put a list here of nutrients. At the top is water, which is technically not a nutrient. I like to add it with the nutrients because water is consumed at about uh, twice the amount of all the other ingredients in, uh, or nutrients uh, combined. So essentially under normal conditions for every pound of water a chicken or pound of feed a chicken will consume, she will drink two pounds of water. Uh, so, uh, and they don't last very long without water. They can last fairly long without feed, but they don't last very long as most living things uh, need to have water uh, in their diet. So I like to add it in, even though it's technically not a nutrient. There are the carbohydrates. Uh, most of the energy or calories in poultry diets come from carbohydrates. Some fats, uh, lipids primarily are going to come. These are the oils. Uh, or, uh, or fat from other, other sources. In most poultry diets, these come in the form of oil that's added to the diet uh, to make it less dusty and also to add energy or calories. The protein, that is, as we said, that's, most, that's made up from amino acids. And so those amino acids, which we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, uh, are required at certain levels, each one. And so those are important. And then of course we have the vitamins and minerals. Uh, they need to have those uh, lacking a, a required vitamin or required mineral will cause significant problems in their health and productivity. So all of these things need to be in a balanced diet, uh, in a balanced diet at some level. Some are much higher than others. Some are only needed in very small amounts. Some of the minerals and vitamins only in very small amounts, but without them, the animal simply doesn't survive. This is hard to see, uh, but this gives you a, uh, this, this comes, well, this comes from the nutrient requirements of poultry. The most recent is 1994. It was my understanding that one was coming out in the summer of 2019, but apparently, at least not I've heard that it has come out. Anyway, uh, it's put out by the National Research Council, National Academy of Science. And what this does is this gives us numbers for every, of, every one of the nutrients that are required by poultry of various types, this in, in this case, this is uh, leghorn type hens uh, that, are, that are laying eggs, okay? So, uh, and depending upon their feed consumption, and so you can see in the, uh, in the, what, the third, fourth, fifth columns where it says 80, 100, 120, that's the number of grams of feed per day they're consuming on average, and so then you look down the list at the nutrient requirements. And so in crude protein, that 80 gram bird eating 80 grams a day needs a, uh, what is that, 18.8% protein. But if it's eating 100 grams a day, it only needs 15% protein. It's eating enough feed to where we can reduce that amount. So production birds are usually in the 100 to 120 range. Non-layers would be in the, in the 80 range. And so we can see under crude protein, there's all of the required amino acids. There are more amino acids than that, but those are, these are the essential amino acids. We go down to the next group, we have fat. There's one fatty acid, linoleic acid, that's required. Now, that's not an issue because we feed a lot of soybean and other uh, ingredients that contain linoleic acid. So it's not something that would generally be considered uh, limiting. There's the macro minerals. These are minerals that are required in relatively high amounts, greater than 100 parts per million in the diet. That's calcium and chloride and sodium, potassium, uh, uh, phosphorus. Uh, those are required at, at levels. You can see what those levels are. And then we have the trace minerals. These are typically required in much smaller amounts, less than, a, less than uh, 100 parts per million. Uh, and so these are, are also called the trace minerals. 
And so uh, these are things like copper and iodine and zinc and things of that nature that are absolutely required. If they don't have them, they don't perform. Uh, but they can be used in fairly small amounts. And you can see even there uh, in copper, there's question marks. We don't know what their, uh, their copper requirements are. It's never been a problem in practical diets, uh, but we don't, that work has just simply not been done. Uh, Fat-soluble vitamins and then the B vitamins are at the bottom of the list. And so this gives us a sense of all of the nutrients that are required and how they came up with these numbers. There were uh, scientists around the country, each one assigned one to vitamins, one to minerals, one to amino acids or whatever. And they look through the literature and they find all of the literature that has for their particular nutrient and they find where the birds perform uh, best at what levels and they make some assumption as to what is where the requirements are. And that's where those numbers come from. Some of them are estimates uh, based on the research because nothing was done on point and some of them are actual uh, uh, developed from research. And so they have all of these kinds of numbers and they have them for, for broilers as well, but this just gives you the detail that's required. Now, when you buy sack feed, this is all taken into account and the diet is formulated to meet all of those requirements. So those nutrients uh, and ingredients, the, the nutrients are all supplied by the ingredients. So the nutrients are what we've talked about, protein, vitamins, fats, carbohydrates. Those are all the nutrients that are required. We feed them ingredients to meet those nutrient requirements. So all of the grains, whether it's corn or, or uh, legume grains like soybean or peas, or it could be wheat, or it could be canola, or it could be lots of different things that are typical feedstuffs, they all have nutrients at various levels, protein, uh, vitamins, minerals, uh, carbohydrates. And so what we've done is we've taken those and gotten book values where we take and, and analyze all of these different grains, find out what exactly is in them, and make some estimates for the averages. And oftentimes we will use averages. If we're very specific, then we would take the, the grain that we actually have and we would get some analysis so we can formulate the diets more accurately. Now these are the typical kinds of ingredients. I'll show you some of those in a minute, but there are some that are pro uh, problem ingredients. Just because it can be used in some species doesn't necessarily can be used in others. Cottonseed meal. California used to be a very large producer of cotton and hence the cotton seed was ground into a meal uh, and could be and it's a very good protein source for certain species of animals. Dairies use a cottonseed meal a, a great deal. Problem is in for laying chickens cottonseed meal has a contaminant that contaminant is what we call gossipol. And gossipol, <clears throat> when, when laying hens eat it, has the, uh, the habit sometimes of turning yolks green in color, <clears throat> and sometimes the albumin will turn pink from a chemical reaction between the normal uh, uh, compounds that are found in egg yolk and, and egg white and with the, uh, the gossipol. So those can be uh, problematic. Canola. Canola is, uh, is a, uh, essentially a, a commercial invention of, of rapeseed. It has this particular name, uh, Can uh, Canada uh, Canadian oil uh, that's free of a certain uh, contaminant. And so rapeseed is not a very good feedstuff, but it was changed into canola. Uh, by breeding and other meat methods, and now it's a, a good uh, a protein source. However, uh, for brown egg layers, most brown egg layers come from Rhode Island reds. Rhode Island reds have a genetic mutation, which doesn't break down a compound well uh, in, in, uh, in canola. And so feeding canola meal to brown egg layers oftentimes will make uh, eggs that have a fishy odor to them. Um, so if you ever have brown hens and you get eggs that have, uh, have fishy odor to them, uh, many times that's from canola that's been used in the manufacturing of those feedstuffs. Many times today they no longer use canola in sack feed because of that particular problem. And then, uh, and then beans are not very good for, uh, for, for chicken diets. Uh, they don't digest uh, the, the beans very well. They have uh, what are called poly uh, uh, 
non-starch polysaccharides, which they can't break down. They don't have the right enzymes to break them down. And it gives them a bellyache and they just quit eating. And so they don't do very well. They don't perform well on these kinds of ingredients. So just with experience, we find out some ingredients are okay. Others are not so good. Now, uh, poultry feed uh, is comprised mostly of grains of some kind. It's the cereal grains. Uh, that would be corn, wheat, barley, oats, could be oats. We don't use a lot of oats or barley in poultry diets for a particular reason. Uh, but we use mostly corn, wheat, uh, and uh, uh, possibly pearl barley, but that's very expensive. And then we also use the legumes for protein. Now, typically, we've used for many years a soybean. Uh, with the uh, new concerns about soybean with, uh, with organic feeds, it's harder to get organic soybean. And so often uh, we will use uh, field peas or some other legume. The problem there is peas have about half the protein of, of soybean, so it, it's hard to directly uh, 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 substitute peas for what we use with, uh, with soy simply because of the lower protein. But that's typically what we're going to use. We rarely use meat meals any longer in poultry diets uh, because of understanding more about vitamins and minerals. We don't really need to use them any longer. We said we wanted high protein, low fiber diets. There are some numbers that are, are particularly common in chickens, somewhere between 12 and 23% protein, depending upon if they're babies, are they adults, are they laying eggs, are they roosters, depending on what we're doing. Turkeys, about the same. However, they do need a higher protein for starters. Uh, we, we are up in the 27 to 28% range with turkeys. And then game bird feeds typically are even higher, up into the highest 30. I've seen as high as 33% protein uh, for some of the game birds uh, to give them a good start. Uh, and generally, we want low fiber. Fiber is not digested by the chickens. Birds in general, they don't have the right enzymes to, uh, to digest fiber, which is cellulose. Uh, it's the same as in our diets. When we eat too much fiber, we get a bellyache, uh, and uh, it, it, it gives us uh, uh, some uh, more regularity. That's why we eat prunes. They're full of fiber. Okay, And so the same thing happens with chickens. And so we don't uh, want to give them much more than about 5% fiber. And then, as I said before, chickens don't have a protein requirement they have amino acid requirements. And so when we're considering the uh, uh, amino acids, on the left side, these are called essential amino acids. These are the 20, essentially 20 amino acids that are required, uh, that are uh, found in nature. There are a few others, uh, but these are the ones that are required and with research of growing chicks. Uh, these are the ones that are required. Essential means they must be in the diet. They are all required. They have to have them all. But the non-essentials, they can synthesize. And so if they don't have any alanine, the top one on the list, in the diet, they can take those other amino acids and in their metabolism, in their liver, they break it all down and rebuild and synthesize alanine. So they're never without alanine. They can make it. But if they don't have arginine in the diet, then they're at a loss. They can't make protein because they can't synthesize the arginine. Those with the arrows next to them, the two bold arrows, methionine and lysine, these are the two that are most commonly uh, limiting in typical poultry diets. Methionine tends to be low in both corn and soy. Uh, and since corn and soy are the basis for most of our diets, we typically will add particularly methionine in a synthetic, uh, as a synthetic feed. Now, if we're feeding organic feeds, we can't use uh, any, to any great extent synthetic amino acids. We're allowed to use a little methionine, but lysine you can't use uh, in a synthetic form if we're feeding uh, or growing organic, certified organic poultry. The other two, uh, with the smaller arrows, isoleucine and tryptophan, sometimes can be limiting. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes we could add in commercial diets, large scale commercial producers may add these, particularly in layers, less so in borders. Uh, we're always gonna be adding methionine because it's always limiting in, in poultry diets. Uh, even organic diets, you're allowed to add two pounds per ton of synthetic methionine. 
Uh, and so they have to be consuming these on a, a constant basis to grow uh, and to, uh, to make egg albumin. Uh, so if they lack some of these, particularly with methionine, the birds don't grow very well and laying birds quit laying or they lay very small eggs because they can't make enough albumin during the egg, uh, uh, egg formation process. So there's the requirement. So the most commonly is methionine and it's a deficiency is common. If you don't add it in diets, uh, you have to add some other ingredient that tends to be high. And those ingredients are things like sunflower meal, sesame meal, uh, things of that nature, which are expensive and not particularly available. And so uh, a deficiency could be common. In organic feeds, uh, you're allowed, because we've never been able to find a, a consistent form of natural methionine to add to organic diets, so we add two pounds per ton of synthetic methionine, or in turkeys, we're allowed three pounds per ton of, uh, of, uh, of methionine. Uh, and so those are routinely added, uh, or the birds simply won't perform well. The lysine, tryptophan, and uh, isoleucine, the deficiencies are uncommon. They do show up from time to time, uh, uh, but they are available, and if necessary, if the source of, of one of the ingredients is low in lysine, then we can add that uh, in a synthetic form. Not in organic diets. Organic diets, you can't add any of this synthetic compound. So when we talk of balanced diets and the uh, amino acids, here's an example. On the left side is soybean meal. And you can see the, 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 the diagonal lines uh, show how much uh, uh, lysine at the 100% requirement level, that's what the dotted line, the vertical dot, dotted line is. And this was done with chicks. This was probably done 50 years ago, but it's still accurate today. Uh, you can see soybean meal tends to be low in methionine. So we fed only soybean meal, those birds are going to be in a methionine deficiency. Sesame meal is low in lysine, but has plenty of methionine. So if we feed only sesame meal, then that's going to mean the birds are going to have a deficiency in lysine. So in our process in formulating diets is to understand that these are, are uh, variable, mix them together in such a way that now on the right-hand side, we have, uh, what does it say? It says two, uh, uh, two parts uh, soybean, one part uh, sesame meal, and we end up with the proper level of, of, uh, of the amino acids. And so we're doing this constantly in formulating diets to make sure all of the limiting things are taken care of, either by the direct feed or by adding some uh, synthetic in the form of uh, some synthetic methionine or something of that nature. Again, can't do that in organic diets. There's our phase feeding uh, proper diet based on age and or productive status. Okay, so that's essentially what the definition of phase feeding is. And when you go to purchase feeds, you can get them in the form of a starter or a grower developer. Now, those are rare anymore. Usually, it's a start and grow. Uh, and the reason that the feed companies have started making start and grow, where it's an all-purpose feed from chick to processed or to throughout their grow cycle, is because it's simply easier. The problem with doing that is that it's, it's a kind of a blend of what they need when they're babies and when they're older. And so it's not giving them everything they need when they're younger and probably giving them a little more than they need in some things when they're older. Uh, but this way, it's easier to formulate. Uh, it's easier for the feed store to, to, to stack, stock them rather than having all these different kinds of feeds that they may not sell very many. So. Uh, so they use a start grow or something of that nature uh, in there. A, a grower developer is, is fed after the starter for layer chicks. But again, these are start grows that go all the way to 16 weeks or whatever. But if possible, it's best to use a starter and then a grower if they're available. A finisher, that's a diet fed to uh, market birds, meat animals, the last week or so that uh, before they go to processing. 
And that gives them a good sense, a good, good finish. Mainly what we're doing in a finisher diet is we're increasing the fat content so they get a layer of fat. Uh, in, in meat animals, fat, while we, we have kind of shied away from fat in the, over the last uh, three or four decades because we've been told that we have to not eat so much fat, but fat in meat is flavor and tenderness. And so when you finish uh, uh, with, with, that, you're, with those kinds of diets, you're going to get a little bit of layer of fat, which improves the flavor. What I tell people to do is simply when they're within uh, a week and a half or so, maybe two weeks of, of processing, just take a little bit of in, whatever you can find, inexpensive vegetable oil, get it at Costco or whatever, and just pour a little bit on the top of their feed, uh, top dress it with oil. You don't want it swimming in oil, but a little bit of extra, that's gonna add calories, that's gonna add some fat, and that's gonna give them a good finish. And then we have breeder diets, which tend to have a little more vitamins. Again, these are hard to get, but if you were to mix them, you could mix them in a, in a certain way. And then a maintenance is for either non-producing hens or roosters, uh, which aren't doing a lot of work. They're not laying eggs, and so they can get away with much lower uh, plane of nutrition. Now, other things are supplements. They're not really feeds. This is things like scratch that you can purchase. This is mainly cracked corn and wheat or some other blend of either whole or cracked grains. And this gives them something to do, but it's not a balanced diet. And you have to consider it things like, like a candy for chickens. Uh, give them a little is okay, but don't let them eat large amounts of this because it just throws the balance of their diet off. Oyster shell is used for, uh, for shell quality. As heads get older, you may notice that shells start to become thinner in areas, they get thin spots, they feel a little sandpapery to the touch. Um, and that's because they're just, they need more calcium. The, and, an oyster shell, again, isn't a magic bullet. It's not going to uh, turn uh, eggs from old hens into eggs that look like a brand new layer, but it will help to, to make the shell uh, stronger. Uh, grit, we talked about grit before, that helps them to grind uh, grains. Sometimes we feed whole grains, um, and that would be similar to scratch. Table scraps, this would be lettuce, and melon rinds, and whatever kinds of things come from our table. Uh, that needs to be used sparingly as well, because those things are mostly fiber and water, and maybe a little, uh, a little sugar, something of that nature. It has a little bit of, of vitamins and protein in it, but very small amounts. And so it they tend to fill up on it. Uh, and, uh, and, and not, uh, not eat their feed. They're kind of like kids in that respect. They're going to eat the things they like and not eat the things they need. And then pasture, and I know uh, this is a pasture seminar. We like to pasture our animals, but realize that biologically, uh, a chicken is really not a pasture animal in the same sense that sheep are. Uh, while they will consume some grass, Chickens out on pasture are looking mostly for seeds and insects. Uh, that's their biology. They aren't uh, herbivores in the sense of eating a lot of grass. They can't digest the grass. So when, when uh, the producers ask me what kind of pasture they should plant, I say things that draw lots of insects and have a big seed head uh, because that's what they're looking for. The problem is that Insects are only there during a portion of the year. Um, and so, uh, and, and when you put 100 chickens out on an acre of land, uh, they're gonna essentially have most of the insects gone in a matter of a week. Uh, and then the, the seeds are only there in the late summer and maybe into the early fall, depending upon species and when they go to seed. Uh, and so, uh, so those things are only available for a short time. And again, they'll eat some of the grass. The grass will help to darken up the yolks. Uh, it, it adds a little bit of omega-3 fatty acids, and the research tells us that pastured birds tend to have a little bit higher omega-3s. It's not a significantly higher, it's not, not going to be a significant nutrient for those eating the eggs, but certainly it is higher, uh, and so there's some advantage there. Uh, but pasture is something that uh, many of the producers that I know uh, basically negate the pasture as a feedstuff and feed them as if they weren't on the pasture. Uh, simply because uh, the pasture doesn't provide a great deal. It, it's some insects, maybe earthworms and things of that nature. 
The drawback there is many of these insects and earthworms are also a uh, secondary host for some of the pathogens. Um, and so you have to be somewhat careful there as well. The texture of feed, uh, whether it's a mash, crumble, or a pellet, uh, it, the formulation is the same. This is simply the, uh, uh, the texture of the feed. Uh, most feeds today are pelletized. Uh, it's just another step in the manufacturing process. And then the pellet, if it's going, if it's formulated for young birds, will be crushed, so it turns it into a crumble. Mash diets are really reserved for laying hens uh, in commercial enterprises. You're, you're not going to be able to generally go to your local feed store and purchase a sack feed that's a mash diet. Now, maybe you can. Some mills may do that, but the big mills typically don't do that. Uh, they put it in the form of a pellet and a crumble, and it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's the same formulation, it's just the way it's presented to the animal. And then you have fermented feeds. I have a, a, a student who graduated here a couple of years ago with me. Actually, she was at Washington State University, uh, but I helped her with uh, uh, feeding uh, naked oats to, to hens. She has uh, been working, uh, now, and she's a postdoc up at uh, WSU or doing some other work, working with another company looking at fermented feeds and has completed a project and found some interesting results with fermented feeds. However, the, uh, between the cost, uh, it's probably not, certainly not the magic bullet that was hoped for. There is some advantage for fermented feeds and we've known that for many years using wet mash back in the old days to fatten up broilers. We used to use a wet mash and, and then that was a mash feed that was soaked in milk, uh, old, generally spoiled buttermilk, uh, and uh, that would add weight to the birds, but uh, that doesn't work so well. Uh, it's hard to deal with. You can't make it ahead of time. You've got to be making it on a daily basis. And what this does, what the fermentation process is thought to do, is it simply begins the digestion process of the grains. They begin to break down so the bird doesn't work as hard uh, metabolically uh, to break down the feed. It's already partially digested through the fermentation process. And so uh, is it bad to do? No. Is it going to save your operation? Probably not. And it is a lot of work. And there is some advantage to it, but it's, again, not the, uh, the magic bullet that some would hope for. Typical feed grains, corn and soy, have been uh, essentially 95% of poultry feeds for the last 50 years. Recently, with the advent of organic feeds and, uh, uh, and the, the idea that corn, most of the corn and soybean crop are all GMO, and so therefore they can't be used in organic diets, other kinds of grains are desirable. Um, and so uh, the others that have been used in relatively high numbers, wheat, barley, and canola, uh, now each one of those has their own problems. Canola, the odor problem we talked about before, both wheat and barley tend to uh, have uh, compounds in the beta-glucans that the bird doesn't digest very well. And essentially, it gives them the runs, okay? It makes them use a lot more water to push the feed through because it gets very thick and viscous in their gut. They have to push it through by drinking more water. It's a good feed, and we've been working with barley. I've got some birds on trial right now on a naked barley or a hullless barley. Uh, and, uh, and, and as itself, if you get the hull off, then it's, it's good. The problem is barley, as you can see even in the picture, is full of a hull. The hull is high fiber, and so, it's, so a, a typical barley ground is going to be 20% fiber, which is too high on the bird, uh, and they just don't digest it well. But if you have a naked barley that during the harvest process looks more like the wheat there that as the hull come off, then it's going to be a, more, a better uh, feedstuff. And so that's what we're, we're in process of, of doing some research on. Other grains that are possible, uh, triticale, which is a, pretty much a Western grain, uh, and that is uh, oats and, or not oats, that's uh, rye and wheat crossed uh, genetically, and we come up with triticale, which we, we've done some work years ago on triticale and found that it worked well in poultry diets, as it formulated into the diet as if it were corn or something else. Oats, 
Uh, again, oats are a grain that doesn't shed its, its hull very easily. So most oats have high fiber. If you can get the naked or hullless oats, that would be much better. And we found very good results feeding laying hens uh, uh, oats at about a 20% level in the diet. Uh, and it worked pretty well. Field peas, uh, that's generally the substitute for, uh, for protein. If you don't use soybean, we use field peas. But soybean tends to have protein levels in the 42 to 46, even as high as 48%. Uh, where field peas are in the mid-20s in percent protein. And so it takes twice as much peas uh, to bring the protein to the same level as soybean. So it's, while it's okay, it's not the best thing. And then legume grains, there's pinto beans there. That, like I said before, they don't work very well uh, for, uh, for poultry diets. And then there's some exotic kinds of things, teff, amaranth, millet, uh, which is the, the little the little balls in the uh, wild bird feed that you would feed your uh, the wild birds out in your in your bird feeder, uh, and then quinoa is a new one. Um, we're starting to grow it here in the Northwest. Uh, we haven't done a lot of work. There is problems with quinoa. Uh, quinoa has a, a, a contaminant. It's called a, a saponin, uh, which is a soapy like material. It's also found on uh, on, on alfalfa. If you take this material fresh off and just harvest it and it's not clean properly, you put it in water and you agitate it, it gets kind of foamy like soap. Okay? And saponin, uh, the, the process of making soap from fat is called saponification. So sap saponins are part of that process. Chemically, they're very similar to soap. And so you try to get rid of those. They need to be washed off. Uh, and so we're we're interested in uh, in here in, the, in next year trying uh, trying some quinoa as a uh, as a poultry feedstuff. Other problem ingredients: cottonseed. They discolor egg yolks. Canola, fishy odors. Wheat, and barley. Digestive problems. Oats, high fiber, so it gives them the, the runs. We've got flax, which causes uh, fishy odors. Flax is used to increase the omega three content. Uh, and, uh, but if you put too much in, more than about five or 6% in the diet, then the eggs uh, or, or even the flesh starts to smell fishy. Rye has digestive problems and chickens really don't like rye very well. Camelina, camelina is like canola. It's one of the mustard family uh, plants, uh, and, but it has a lot of toxins. It's only approved to be fed at 10% level in poultry diets. And then sorghum milo, which is similar to corn, uh, it's a little, it's about the size of a BB, a little red, uh, little red seed, but it's full of tannins, which are also contaminants. And these are all problem ingredients. So they're typically used very little in poultry diets simply because of the problems that they may have. When feeding different species, we can use the, generally use the same kinds of ingredients, uh, but generally there's a different formulation because they have a different uh, nutrient requirement to, uh, compared, to, compared to chickens. When we're considering feedstuffs, we have to consider how available are they? Um, are they what, what quantity? So like quinoa, uh, quinoa might be the best feedstuff ever for poultry, but it's only grown in very small areas at very low uh, amounts of acreage. So you can't get very much of it. And so it's not particularly available. It could be seasonal. And when you uh, run out, then you have to use something else. And so this is one of the reasons that corn and soy, which are our primary crops, are grown on, on millions of acres of land and there are uh, uh, billions of bushels produced. So that's always available. Uh, and so, and plus it's a very good, uh, a good grain other than the GMO uh, content for organic feeds. It is, uh, it is one of the better grains. Uh, some of these uh, feedstuffs can be variable from year to year, and so you can't count on them being there both year to year and ge in, in various geographical locations because of weather or other things. Some of the nutritional quality uh, is, uh, is variable as well. Uh, they're dry matter. Sometimes they're not particularly stable, and so you have to make sure that they have that. We have to consider how much uh, it costs of where they're grown, how much it costs to ship it. Um, all of our corn, or most of our corn out here in the western U.S. comes from the Midwest. It's all brought out on train cars. Um, and so there's an extra cost for us here as opposed to back in the Midwest. And that's why poultry, the majority of poultry is grown in the Midwest and the Southeast. 
because they're close to where the, the, the feed ingredients, the typical feed ingredients are grown. And then of course the cost, uh, depending on what they cost, they may or may not be valuable as a feedstuff. Quinoa, for example, is used in human in foods, and so uh, uh, chances of being able to buy it, uh, uh, purchase large amounts of quinoa at a price that's designed for animal feed is probably not going to happen. So the cost is going to be higher. Uh, and then the anti-nutritional factors, some of the kinds of contaminants that might be in feeds. Here are some of those contaminants. Protein inhibitors, proteinase inhibitors, so it, it, it reduces the ability of the enzymes to be able to digest things. So when the chicken produces an enzyme, these anti-nutritional factors break down that enzyme, and so it's not, it doesn't work. Uh, the lecithins, uh, uh, these are glycoproteins that can be toxic to their intestinal lining and their mucosal, and so they, they end up having problems. Uh, tannins, they combine with other uh, compounds, particularly carbohydrates, uh, CHO or is, is carbohydrate, short for, for carbohydrate. They form complexes, and so they bind things up so they don't work well. The phytates, uh, these, uh, these bind or chelate with, with some of the minerals uh, and other things, so they're not useful in diets. And then the non-parts polysaccharides, this is one of the biggest ones because they're, they're fairly common in, in, as a starchy compound, but they don't break down under the typical amylase starch uh, enzymes uh, because the, the enzyme doesn't know what it is because it's not, the, not exactly the same. It's similar, but it's not uh, the same. And so the birds have problems uh, digesting. Commercially, when we feed these that have high uh, uh, non-starch polysaccharides, we feed them enzymes. It's kind of like if anybody in the audience is uh, lactose intolerant, uh, sometimes you will take a, a, a lactase uh, uh, or a lactate milk that has the lactase in it, or you'll take a pill that helps you digest the lactose. Um, and the same thing is true in, in poultry. When they, we know we're feeding these, we're gonna feed them some enzyme. As I said, uh, it's a major cost. Feeding is a major cost. Uh, and then uh, when you, uh, purchase feeds in sack form, you are paying the highest price because that's the retail level of, of feed. So uh, the large producers, the mills can, can produce it much cheaper than, uh, than you can purchase it uh, at a feed store. Uh, it's probably twice the cost when it's put in a sack because you have to pay for the sack and the labor to sack it and, and all of those kinds of things. And then it even goes higher when it's organic feeds. Uh, because they're not easily obtainable. It's uh, out of the total uh, amount of soy or corn grown in the U.S., only a small percentage, five or 10 percent maximum, is, non, uh, is, is uh, organic uh, and non-GMO. And so it's hard to get. So sometimes we're going to import those uh, organic grains from uh, other parts of the world, and then quality tends to suffer as well. So uh, we have to be somewhat careful. We'll go into organic feeds. Um, organic feeds are exactly the same, and there's there's other than their uh, the be, where they come from. As far as the grains, uh, there's nothing that you can measure uh, on uh, organic feeds. We've never seen anything if we just use organic versus uh, non-organic feeds any difference in feed uh, growth rates or egg production. The difference is organic feeds are not supposed to have uh, synthetic uh, compounds in them. So we're not supposed to have uh, grains that have been sprayed with uh, synthetic compounds, herbicides and pesticides, things of that nature, uh, and nor are they to be uh, GMO uh, type as well. And so they need to be certified. So to, to label organic uh, poultry, they have to be certified organic feeds uh, fed to them and then you have to be inspected for that purpose. The same thing's true if they're on a, on a pasture, they have to be on a certified organic pasture. Synthetic additives in organic feeds, some, the vitamins that are added are all synthetic, and that's okay. By, by uh, definition, synthetic uh, uh, vitamins are okay. Or amino acids are not okay, except for the variants of methionine already talked about that, two pounds per ton for chickens, three pounds per ton for turkeys uh, to, make, to meet that requirement. Uh, 
and so uh, those are the only, uh, not the only synthetic. There are other things that you can add, uh, but these are the ones that are commonly added in organic feeds. I put here a, uh, this is a kind of a, of a diet that actually comes out of a, a UC Davis uh, publication from my time as an undergraduate there back in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, it was written at that time and had been out for a long time as feeding poultry is what sort of the publication is. And I, I kind of took that and I modified it a little bit just to, uh, to shorten it. But essentially, uh, you can formulate diets by uh, doing this kind of a process, some grains, and then depending on if it's a storer, a grower, or a layer diet, depending on the age of the bird, the phase feeding, you would then uh, adjust how much of the grain. Notice the uh, starter diet has lower amounts of grain. And when we go down to the soybean meal, peanut meal, the protein source, you can see that's higher and goes lower as they get older because we need more protein in the young animal diet where less protein in the older animal diet. And so you can see that's where they, they change a little bit. And then some other ingredients just to hit all of these nutrients to make sure it's a balanced diet. In this case, we've given them some meat meal or fish meal. Uh, in organic diets, you can't feed fish a uh, meat meal. You can feed fish meal if it's under USDA uh, guidance, if it's GAP, which is a, the uh, uh, Global Animal Partnership organic requirements that you can't use fish meal. Uh, it's always nice if you can use animal diets, uh, animal feedstuffs to put them in because that helps to fix a lot of the amino acid issues and other things. Alfalfa meal will help there, brewer's yeast, milk powder. You can't use milk in uh, organic diets. You can use brewer, brewer's yeast. Again, that's helped to help add vitamins and some of the amino acids. There's a, a vitamin supplement with primarily with A and D and riboflavin. You have to add salt in the diet. They have to have sodium. And so five pounds per ton of salt, 0.5%. Uh, and then some phosphorus, uh, 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 what's the word, calcium and phosphorus requirements. So ground limestone, oyster shell, uh, uh, bone meal, which is hard to get nowadays, or dicalcium phosphate, something of that nature. And those are the hardest things to get for uh, small producers that are trying to mix diets. Uh, you have to order them or whatever. Uh, some places will have them, but uh, you have to kind of search around to find them. Just to give you an idea of some stuff that we've done locally, Um, some recent research uh, with locally produced kinds of things. Here's some stuff that we've done. Uh, this is what we did with beans. Uh, the, the bird up on the left, up, up left side, that's the, the birds of the same age. Uh, the chicken or the, the sea, uh, the, the chicken there, that's a, it's a Cornish cross. That's the control diets, corn soy diet. The W is with white beans uh, and just added as a formulated diet. So the numbers were the same, just the presence. You can see the difference in the uh, growth rate, you can look over at the, uh, at the graph and you see the, uh, at the top at wheat six, uh, the birds uh, were uh, two and a half uh, kilograms, uh, where uh, the control birds and the others were all uh, uh, more than a kilogram lower in weight. And so they're very uh, relatively small in a, uh, because of the, of the ingredients. Uh, there's the, uh, some beans of different kinds of beans. Uh, we ended up having uh, growth differences. Uh, we had some digestive problems, uh, paste events. Uh, they don't digest beans very well. High mortality overall, and it's just not a good diet. So beans simply don't work. We don't use beans in poultry diet. Uh, here were some others that we used, garbanzo beans, lentils, and field peas. So these are some more legumes. And you can see that body weights were fairly close. Uh, five, these, this is now in pounds, five and a half pounds at six weeks of age on the corn soy diet. And the others were right at five pounds. So we, we lost about a half a pound, a third of a pound in weight gain. Uh, but feed conversions were best in the control, but not so far behind are the other diets. And so they were able to maintain uh, growth rate with some of these others. Now, uh, would I suggest using lentils? Uh, it's very expensive to use lentils. And so if you want to use lentils, they could be used in a, in a diet as well. Uh, 
So when we summarize some of this alternative stuff, uh, uh, you do sacrifice growth and feed conversion. They're not always easy to find, but they can be used in, in diets as long as you're not having to get maximum productivity. We did all this with broilers. We didn't do any layers on this. It just did not work. Uh, here's some more, uh, uh, some of the, the nutrients uh, and ingredients uh, and what they do uh, to some of those. This is a bit of a repeat of what we've already talked about uh, before. Uh, some of the minerals you're going to get by adding a, some kind of mineral premix. Uh, when I mix diets, uh, in recent years, we've been doing all organic stuff, uh, working with the oats and barley. And uh, a company called Fertrells puts out a poultry neutral balancer, which is for organic diets. It has methionine in it at the proper levels, and it has salt in it, it has uh, the thionine, it has all the minerals, the vitamins, it's very easy. It's not cheap, uh, but for uh, you, but one bag, it's 60 bucks or 80 bucks a bag, and it uh, will make one ton of feed from that, eight, uh, that 60 pound bag, and so it works well. It has all of these in there, the minerals uh, of, of all the different types uh, that are required. Here's some of the required uh, minerals, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, all of these are required. Those are going to be in a premix. Uh, very hard to do this individually, so you can purchase a premix for poultry and you add it at a certain amount per ton one, two, three, four, five pounds per ton, whatever the formulation is. You read the label instructions and you add it at that particular level. There's sodium. Salt is absolutely required. We did some work years ago when I was a graduate student at Davis. We formulated the diets and somehow the salt got left out. Uh, and these were chunker cartridges. Uh, when we, the hatch day, they were 17 grams average weight. At two weeks of age, they were 19 grams average weight. They only gained two grams. They should have been four times the size, and they had gained only two grams. And then we looked back, and we found that they had lacked uh, uh, sodium in the diet. And so it's absolutely required. Now, if you put too much sodium, then they have other problems. And so you have to have things balanced. Uh, and there's potassium and chloride as well. Here's some, some others. Here's some of the minerals. This is what happens. Uh, I've just put some, uh, some pictures here. Uh, manganese deficiency over there on the top right. That's called porosis. Uh, slip tendon, they go lame uh, if they lack um, uh, uh, manganese in the diet. Zinc uh, causes bone and feather problems. I didn't have a good feather picture, but down in the middle on the bottom, you see the scruffy coat on there. On that uh, that steer there, or the, uh, and that's uh, that's from a lack of z of uh, zinc in the diet. Uh, the one on the left, the, the 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 lamb standing there with that funny gait, that's uh, white muscle disease. That's from selenium deficiency. Now, livestock cattle have a much higher requirement for selenium than chickens do, about three times the requirement. And so, uh, usually, we don't see selenium problems with chickens because it's just that the requirement is so low that uh, they, it's met by the grains that you feed. And then iodine is required for the thyroid function. Again, we don't really see this too often in chickens, but you check out on the, the, uh, the cow on the bottom right, that's a goiter, and so the, the thyroid gland is involved. Sources of these are the grains themselves, and then we add either meat and bone meal or limestone, ground limestone, uh, sodium, chloride, uh, and uh, in form of salt, iodized salt we'll use on a regular basis, and then we use some kind of a, a, a trace mineral mix uh, as well. Uh, vitamins, here are the vitamins that are required. Vitamin C is not required by livestock. Uh, whether it's poultry or large animals, they don't require uh, the same vitamins. We, we require vitamin C, they don't. Uh, and so there's the vitamins A, D, E, and K, and then the B complex, which are listed all down there at the bottom. Uh, and again, a vitamin premix, and then you don't have to worry about all this. You get a vitamin mineral premix and you just add it at a uh, prescribed amount on a you know one pound per ton or a three percent level or whatever it is uh, and you uh, and you have all of those requirements are there. Uh, chickens require vitamin D3 uh, and when we put them outside they don't need it but if they're inside then they will need a vitamin D, a vitamin D in the diet or they'll So when they're pasturing, you really don't have to add vitamin D in the diet because they're outside. Uh, there's a reaction in the skin from sunlight. 
uh, UV and sunlight to uh, to give them. Uh, they will synthesize enough vitamin. And there's some of the problems when vitamins are lacking. Uh, the highest uh, vitamin deficiency uh, we see is riboflavin, vitamin B2. Anytime you see chickens that look like that, where they have what's called curled toe paralysis, that's generally a, uh, a deficiency of, uh, of riboflavin in the diet. Also, there are hatchability problems. If eggs don't hatch, uh, that can be a problem. And then vitamin B12, which was discovered, the most, one of the most recent vitamins discovered. It was discovered in the late 1940s. Um, and uh, that's an animal-only uh, vitamin. It comes from animal products. And so uh, we used to call it the animal manure factor. When chickens were grown in the barnyard with other animals, they would, uh, um, they would not have problems. If they were grown away from those other animals, they would have problems. Uh, it didn't grow well, didn't grow well, they didn't have uh, uh, good hatchability on their eggs. So they called it the animal manure factor until vitamin B12 was isolated and uh, feeding vitamin B12, which is part of a typical pro, uh, vitamin premix today uh, that uh, gives them a, a, the, a background of having enough, enough vitamins. Where are we? I'm over my time, so I need to find out if you want to keep going or there's something else. I mean, I, I don't, may have a few more slides, so uh, let me know what your pleasure is. I can answer questions or whatever. Hey, Jim. Hey. Uh, why don't we go to some questions online um, and then, um, I don't know, can you pick one of your favorite uh, remaining topics in, in about five minutes to kind of kind of wrap okay. up after that or five or ten minutes, something like that, if that's okay with folks? Um, so why don't we do the questions online? Macy, do you want to see if can he? Yeah. He'll have that. Yeah. Um, hopefully you can hear this okay. Uh, we just yeah. have one question online uh, from way back toward the beginning of your presentation. Um, does fermented feed also refer to spent alcohol grains? No, that would not be the same. Those would be distiller dry, uh, distillers dried grains or brewers dried grains. So that's going to be different. Uh, and those are, are very good diets for particularly laying hens. We tend to get thicker albumin when we feed uh, uh, brewer grains or distiller grains to chickens. Um, Realize what's happened is uh, those are mostly barley uh, and maybe some other things depending upon here, it's mostly barley. Uh, but that uh, in the fermentation process, much of the starch has been turned into alcohol, sugar and then alcohol. And so the starch content is lower uh, and the protein tends to go higher. The one problem with these is when you to get them wet. And so they either have to be fed right away because they will go, uh, go bad quite quickly when they're in a wet state, or they need to be dried. And so when the commercial industry purchases them, they get dried grains, brewers dried grains, and that, that's uh, actually a good thing. Those are, those are good sources, but that would not be similar to fermented feeds, only it's, uh, it's under a lot uh, more uh, precise control on distilling. Any questions from the audience in the room? I had a quick question, uh, Jim. Um, can you comment on any uh, um, open source software that people might be able to to utilize if they were keen on trying to make any of their own rations? Uh, certainly, there we use one, and I can't remember the name. It's called Woofda, and I think it was uh, developed by. Carl Parsons out of Illinois or something. Uh, and, and it's a fairly good uh, program. It's free online. Can you now spell it's that? Not, it's not a, a, a formulation program that is going to do all the work for you. Um, it has a database. It has the values for most of the kinds of typical feedstuffs most of the grains and soy and, and things of that nature, even some we rarely use, but they're there. 
the book values are there. Add more if you want to, you can find book values and add them. Um, uh, but it's a bit hit and miss. And so you, what it does primarily is you tell it how you want in the diet. Uh, you want a, you know, a 20 percent of this, 20 percent of that, and then it will tell you what the nutrient levels are. And then you've got to go back and hunt and peck a little bit, and then adjust and say, well, I'm gonna take two percentage points out of this one and add it to this one. And so um, now some of the more expensive ones, where you're going to pay thousands of dollars for the software, you just tell it what your ingredients are, what you have available, what do they cost, and what you want in the diet. And it will formulate that diet very accurately, if it can. Sometimes it can't, because you're asking it to do something it can't do. Uh, and it will tell you that. But uh, those are far more powerful, but they're also very more expensive. And those are the kinds of things that nutritionists will use than their formulating diets. Um, so but I do a bit of hit and miss. And so I start off, and it takes me a, an hour or so to be able to get things where they need to be. You using the information from the guide that I showed earlier, and that way you can, uh, you can get them so they're fairly close. And do you want to spell that just for people that didn't catch the, the name? <laughs> it's capital letters, uh, it's all caps, W-U-F-F-D-A, I think something like that. It might not be exact. Okay. And I can, I can send you an email of a copy of it, and you can... And then the last question I had just for small farmers, what are your, what are your general recommendations on for people that want to start um, producing their own feed uh, for smaller flocks, you know, below several hundred or several thousand layers or hens? Do you, is there a text you recommend? Is there any equipment that you recommend that are, that are, um, pieces of machinery that are that are 100 percent necessary um well for equipment purposes you will need to have uh, a grinder and a mixer there are complexes that you can get they're fairly small you've got to look for them um, and uh, they have on a trailer they have a small grinder usually some kind of a hammer mill will ground, grind maybe um, 100 pounds in 10 minutes, something like that. And then there's a small mixer that will probably, uh, in the same complex of, of equipment, uh, that may be able to, to mix, say, 500 pounds at a time. And so you would need that to be able to mix the diets. If you don't grind it, if you use it in a cafeteria form, you just take whole grains and mix them together, so it kind of looks like pigeon feed or some of the organic diets you'll see that haven't been ground. The, the chickens tend to pick the things out they like. And we did this once. We, we, uh, we used some commercially available organic feeds and we uh, fed them in a tube feeder, which is a hanging tube feeder. And uh, all around the edge, they took the, I think, I don't know what, I think it was canola, it might've been, I don't remember, but there was a pile of all these seeds they wouldn't eat right around the edge of the, of the, of the feeder because they didn't like to eat that. Uh, and when that's left out, well, then that's been used in the formulation, so we don't know what's in there. So, uh, so that would, uh, would not, not work very well. And then um, if they want to grow their own, that becomes a little more problematic. You have to really look, first of all, where they're located and kinds of things will grow there uh, to make it worthwhile. Uh, corn and soy don't grow very well here on the West Coast. Our, our nights are too cool, particularly here in the Northwest. Now maybe in the Central Valley, uh, they may grow a little better and, uh, uh, and so you may want to do that. However, it does take some significant acreage to, to, to grow these kinds of things. Uh, to, to have any amount. If you're, if you're making several thousand pounds of, uh, of feed a month, then you have to have a pretty, pretty high, sizable source. What you could do would be to grow some of the uh, uh, non-standard feedstuffs, and that's kind of what we're doing with the, the naked oats and barley, where you would grow that part, but you would also 
purchase in some, if you're organic, some organic corn and organic soy, and then mix in some of the stuff that you've grown. That might be um, a little easier, uh, or, uh, or fine grains or, or ingredients that will grow well where you're located. It's just uh, uh, the things that we typically use in poultry feed, the corn and soy, grow best back in the Midwest where you have summer rain, which we don't have here, uh, even uh, you know, throughout the West Coast, we don't have a lot of summer rain. And at least in our region, the, the nights are too cold. It just does not perform well uh, here when even in the summertime, it's 85, 90, 95 degrees during the day. In our area, it drops down in the 50s at night. Uh, and so the corn just virtually stops growing. And so you don't get the yields that you get uh, back in the Midwest where it stays 80 degrees at night. And then my, my last question um, was, um, I guess for the newbies out there, like what, what are the one or two common mistakes that, that people typically make um, that you're aware of that hopefully our audience can avoid if they decide to go down that road of uh, trying to make some of their own feed? Probably the first thing is don't necessarily go cheap some feed ingredients. I visited a fairly large organic uh, place and they, uh, they had purchased organic grains and, and they were in totes, in the, in the canvas totes, sitting on the barn floor uh, and you opened the top and they were full of rat poop. Uh, and their idea was, well, it's just organic. But uh, as a veterinarian, you know, you don't want to be uh, encouraging the chickens to eat a lot of rat dropping. They have all kinds of other disease problems. So you need to purchase feeds that are decent. I mean, they don't have to be human quality, but they certainly need to be high livestock quality. Then you need to get some good information on formulating diets. A lot of extension pubs out there, you know, like the one that I shared, the California pub, uh, feed poultry. Also, some of the other large poultry states, Arkansas, uh, uh, Auburn University probably has some. Uh, uh, Purdue, North Carolina State, they all probably have some, some uh, extension pubs on, on formulating diets. Uh, and then you, or you can purchase a book. The, of the one that I use is called the com Commercial, uh, what is it? Commercial Chicken Feeding Manual. Leeson out of, out of Canada is uh, uh, on East Coast in, uh, or on the East Side of Canada. He has produced a, a book that I use. It's very practical as opposed to a nutrition text that deals with all the chemistry. He doesn't worry about the chemistry. He does the feeding value. And it will talk about a lot of the different things. Why don't we use oats in diets? You know, so if you've got this idea where I can buy oats really cheap, maybe you can use that. Well, maybe you, maybe you can, but should you? And so that's, and that book will give that kind of information. But also a lot of those extension pumps are going to be going to be valuable if you're trying to mix your own feeds. And then, then the other thing is, if you're going to do this commercially and you want to be successful, it's always best to try to, and even the large, large producers that have their own feed mill, they'll find somebody, a nutritionist somewhere, and pay them a little, but give them, uh, let them look at the diet and they'll help you formulate it. Because uh, if you make a mistake, uh, you know, we had this happen to us. We had 2,000 hens that were laying. We purchased feed from a local mill, uh, and uh, they neglected to put calcium in the diet. Within two days, all the birds went out of production. There wasn't enough calcium in the diet. It took another two months to recycle those birds to get them back into production. And so if you're relying on that for income, then uh, you're going to be devastated. And so, uh, and, and then there are other things we had, I had an experience with a uh, producer that uh, lost about 2,000 uh, guinea fowl over the course of about seven or 10 days. He had just brought in a new uh, batch of feed at this time. He thought he had a disease problem. And so I asked him a little bit about it. And he said, well, a few days before that, uh, uh, birds, so the floor got in the pen got all wet. 
And so I told him, I think it's a nutrition problem because all the birds died, the 2000, they were all dead. I said, there isn't very many diseases that will kill them all, except with the possible exception of high path influenza and the Newcastle. Um, and so, uh, so probably not a disease organism. So it sent me a feed sample. So he sent me a feed sample uh, and the requirement for sodium in the diet is 0.15%, the feed came back 7% sodium. Uh, and so essentially the birds were drowning in their own fluid, drinking so much water to negate the sodium. They found out that the mill had gotten a, a deal on cracker meal. Cracker meal was full of salt and they added the normal amount of salt in, in addition and so now they had five times, 10 times the amount of salt that was supposed to be in the diet, and the birds all succumb to that. So you have to be very careful uh, and be ready to fix things if you have to, uh, possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. Great, any other questions online or in the room? Okay. Jim, do you have uh, maybe one more topic you really wanted to highlight and then we can wrap up and then we'll take a little break for a few minutes and then we'll um, transition to the farmer roundtable part of the workshop. Let me, uh, I'm gonna go run through my slides so you'll see my slides and see what else is here. This is just all nutrient stuff. Uh, This is duplicate. Here, let me uh, let me do this. Um, okay, so um, this is a pasture group, and and, uh, and 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 so pastures are are important parts of the management system. Oh, so it, it can be management, but not necessarily part of their feed. So if you use that as a management system, rather than considering it feed. When I first came to Oregon, I had a, a my, actually my first feed call. I'd been in Oregon for about two weeks. I went and visited a guy that had geese, uh, and uh, the geese were not doing well. One was down, uh, and as I was, uh, I went out and visited his farm, and they didn't look very good. And I asked him what he was feeding them. He said, well, I don't feed them anything. They just eat the pasture. And there was an apple tree. This is in, in, the, in October. So the apples are spent and they're falling off the tree. Whenever an apple would fall off the tree, the, the, the geese would go running after the apple to eat it. And so I asked him if he was feeding and he said no, because they were on pasture. And I told him, well, yes, geese are kind of pasturing animals. They eat a lot more grass and they have the ability to digest their cica. That we, we talked about it uh, early in the talk. Uh, their cica are much more elaborate in waterfowl than they are in chickens. And so they could eat a little bit of it, but they're not going to be able to survive on only. Uh, and so he needed to feed them. We took a, a, a coffee can of his chicken feed and put it down and those birds were just famished. And so, uh, Hopefully he started feeding them for uh, the rest of their, their time there. That was 35 years ago, so I don't know what happened. So in really in pasture, if we consider it for feeding purposes, it's management, it's okay, but for feeding purposes, as I said before, chickens are not pasturing animals. Where chickens came from is the jungles of Southeast Asia. And so the scratching behavior that they do, that was really to move the debris on the bottom of the forest floor, the jungle floor, the leaves and sticks, to get those out of the way so they can see the insects and the seeds underneath. So that's really what they're doing. Uh, they're really not, they don't have the ability to digest cellulose. When cattle and sheep are eating cellulose, that cellulose goes into their rumen, and they have a huge population of microbes. Uh, bacteria and protozoans that, that synthesize cellulase, which is the enzyme to break down cellulose, and they can get energy from that. The animals themselves, cattle do, can't make that. They have to have the microbes. Chickens, while there are a few microbes in their cica, there's not enough to be able to feed them, and so, uh, so they really don't digest the cellulose very much. 
And so most of that goes through them essentially unchanged. Um, and so the benefits of the pasture are the insects and seeds that that pasture will draw to them. And so, um, so when, as I said before, when they ask what kind of pasture, uh, basically I, there's a guy up here at WSU at Washington State that did some work with pasturing uh, chickens. And he's developed a, uh, a pasture uh, grass uh, combination of uh, some uh, broad leaves, some grasses, and then some legumes like alfalfa or, uh, or some other soybean or something that are part of the seeds. And so there's a whole variety of things, like clover and other things in the, in the pasture mix. Uh, so there's a variety and that tends to bring in more insects and then it creates some seeds. And then if you look at our pastures here, this is, this is actually my pasture in my, my home. Uh, you can see what it looks like in March. It's a wet, muddy mess and nothing really grows there. I have some sheep here. Uh, and so the pasture is not very good. May is the best time for the pasture. It's in full uh, growth uh, and sheep have been, uh, have been grazing on this for a while. So it's still pretty good. But then when you get to December or September, the rain has stopped, uh, everything dries back. It has really little value, even for the sheep are not gonna be able to get very much out of that pasture. And so pasture is only good for a portion of the year, unless it's irrigated, or you take, uh, or you move out of the Western part of the US and you go back to the Midwest where they get rains during the summer and then the pasture can stay green without irrigating. So uh, pasturing is a, is a good process, uh, but it's, think of it in terms of providing insects and seeds for a portion of the year, and you'll be much better off. You have to provide them some feed. And then I, uh, I looked at this. Uh, I saw this when I was going through. Here's a process. I got this off the internet of, of soaking feed to allow fermentation to occur. Um, and there was just this uh, one part feed and 1.2 parts of water, mix it together, and let it sit for a couple of days. And what you're going to increase is both lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria. Uh, so you're gonna get a lot of odor coming off of this material. Uh, and it works fine, but if it goes one too many days, the birds won't eat it. It'll get too acidic and they, won't, and they don't like it. Uh, and uh, you have to do it every day. Uh, so it's not something that you can put off unless you want to give it to them as a treat or something of that nature. But if it's an actual part of their feeding program, then it's a, a real process that you have to go through on a daily basis to make sure that you have, uh, have this available uh, for them. Uh, here's some of the effects of a, a, a paper that I, I read on this. So uh, you found some reduced dry matter intake. So in other words, they ate less feed. It improved their feed conversion. But it becomes unacceptable in some cases after a few hours. of They found that the animals fed fermented feeds tend to increase their aggressiveness and their feathering wasn't as good. Um, it reduced some of their natural foraging behaviors and it reduced their calcium content because it tends to separate. When you put it in the water, the, all of the, uh, the calcium is heavy, so it drops to the bottom. Uh, rather than staying, uh, like, so you so you must mix it during the fermentation. You got to keep stirring, it and then make sure that oyster shell is available as well to make sure they have that uh, uh, that content. Now it uh, it increases the availability, which is a good thing. A phytate phosphorus increases in crude protein because you're losing some of that carbohydrate, and the uh, non-parts polysaccharide uh, levels go up, and that's a bacterial. But we did find some increased body weight uh, and increased egg weight, but reduced egg mass, which means while the, whoops, while the eggs were bigger, uh, they didn't uh, lay as many eggs. So there is some advantage to fermenting feeds, but again, it's not the best. Uh, that, uh, that's something. Hey, Jim, we're going to have to wrap up now, but okay. um, thank you so much for your time. and. Um, we'll, if it's okay with you, we'll um, work on editing this and posting this on um, our YouTube channel so people can, uh, can, can watch it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Maurice. We'll see you.